are invited. Uh, and then also don't forget two Sundays from now, uh, during Sunday school, uh, Nathan and I are going to be meeting with uh, parents of uh, older kids, teenagers, uh, and go over some things that uh, hopefully uh, will be helpful for you and make you aware of some things that our kids are definitely facing and going through. So um, hope you'll make plans for that. All right, let's have our ushers come forward. We'll receive our evening offering. Let's Steve, will you give thanks, please? stand as we sing our second and last hymn for the evening. I will call upon the Lord, hymn 24 in your hymnal. may be seated. Have your Bibles go with me to the book of Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. A retired preaching professor wrote about the true story of a man who experienced a rude awakening in church. Uh, He generally slept in church, so he had dropped off like he always did. Only this time, there was a power outage, and it left the auditorium in total darkness. The pastor did not use his notes. He just kind of kept right on preaching uh, through the blackout. And so uh, somewhere towards the end of the sermon, the groggy member woke up. He rubbed his eyes, but he could not see a thing. He heard the preacher and he could feel his wife and his daughter on either side of them, but everything was pitch black. So in a state of panic, he declared, he stood up and he yelled, somebody help me, I'm blind. 
Laughter filled the room. And one complacent church member experienced revival at the altar of embarrassment. And one blessed pastor enjoyed poetic justice. One other. There was a man who always fell asleep in church. That's how the story goes. Because the preacher was so long-winded. Can you imagine that? So the pastor was so agitated about it that he gave one of his deacons a stick to hit the guy over the head with. So every time the man dozed off, he would hit him on the head. So once the man dozed off, the deacon tapped him on the head and he woke him up. A few minutes later, he started dozing again, so the deacon hit him again, only this time a little harder, but only to wake him temporarily. When he fell asleep a third time, the deacon hit him so hard that he knocked him out of the pew and onto the floor, almost knocking him out. Rather than responding in anger, the church member simply said, Hit me again. I can still hear him preaching. Um, there was a blog I came across in, in preparing. Um, and, and on this blog, the guy had written a thing called Falling Asleep in Church. And he wrote this. He said, So what do you do if you're the one that falls asleep in church? How do you, I love this, he says, how do you re-enter the atmosphere once your body has done that awkward, oh snap, we're asleep in church, jerk, that kind of feels like you just did a quantum leap back into the sanctuary. Y'all know what we're talking about, right? You doze off and you do that kind of a thing. He says, so uh, what to do when you wake up after falling asleep in church? He gives two suggestions. He says, number one, Pretend that your head bob was just a deep, long nod of agreement. He goes on to say, he says, the first thing you want to do after you wake up is to try and recreate whatever weird shudder or spastic head nod that you had just snapped you, snapped you back to attention. He said, if you do one big jerky motion and then sit there like a bank robber that's frozen against the wall in a spotlight, it's going to be obvious that you were asleep. He said, instead, do a series of head nods that uh, look like you're shaking your head in agreement with something poignant that the minister said. He says, quote, nothing to see here, folks, just really feeling the sermon, just brushing the dirt off my shoulder and nodding along to the message. So if you fall asleep and wake up, just start nodding and everybody will know. And then he said, secondly, he says, what you don't do is resist the urge to pretend you were praying. He says, apparently, much like Val Kilmer's character in the movie Tombstone, I'm not going to do the voice, though it's tempting, my hypocrisy goes only so far. He says, resist the urge to pretend that you were locked deep in holy communion with God because everybody knows you were not. Now, so why in the world do I bring this up? Well, because in Acts chapter 20, something happens. We have the first ever account of someone falling asleep in church. Now, there have been thousands upon thousands of people that have done it ever since then. But here is probably the first account that we have of somebody falling asleep in church. Now, falling asleep can be dangerous if you're driving or something like that. And as we'll come to find out, it actually can be dangerous falling asleep in church. So let's read in chapter 20. Uh, I want to start with just verses 7 through 9 to kind of lay the groundwork of, of, of what I'm talking about, and then we're going to go back to verses 1 through 6. So verse 7 says, On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered, and a young man named Eutychus, Eutychus, uh, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. So let's, uh, before we kind of look at what happens after that and, and, and those kinds of things of what we just read, let's go back to verses 1 through 6 and, and kind of bring us up to speed of where we are in the book of Acts. And so in verses 1 through 6, uh, we have Paul visiting churches to encourage them. He says in verse 1, after the uproar ceased, you remember that in Ephesus? Remember there was the, 
the riot uh, that, that almost happened in Ephesus. He says, so after the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and after the, encouraging them, he said farewell and departed for Macedonia. And when he had gone through those regions, he had given them much encouragement. He came to Greece. There he spent three months, and when a plot was made against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. So Sopater, or Sopater, excuse me, the Berean, son of Pyr uh, Pyrrhus, accompanied him, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby, and Timothy and the Asians, uh, Tychicus and uh, Tro. Uh, Troph Trophimus, there it is, I'll get it right in a minute. Um, these went on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas, but we set sail from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days we came to them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. So what we see, Paul uh, came out of Ephesus. Uh, if you remember all that we looked at concerning that, uh, the, the dangerous situation that they had found themselves in, they get out of that, and Paul and the others travel from church to church to encourage the, the young churches. Now, of course, we know this isn't the first time we see Paul uh, going around encouraging the churches. Uh, we have talked about that before. Now, we need to remember that some of these young churches, that, that they were in very dangerous situations, and they were going through some very hard times. And like young Christians, these young churches needed encouragement. So I just wanted to throw something in here about encouraging young believers. Now, I know we all need encouragement, right? Whether we're a young, young believer or we've been in the faith for years and years and years, we all need encouragement. But, but young believers especially need encouragement. Um, if, if, uh, no, matter where, no matter how long they've been in the church, if they're just coming to Christ, then they are new babes or they are babes in Christ, right? They are new to Christianity. It doesn't matter how long they've been in the church. They could have been in the church 30 years, but when they, whenever they get saved, they're babes in Christ. And so they need encouragement. It's possible that some of those people that's coming to Christ have friends and family that are not believers, and some of them may try to get them to go back to their old way of life. And therefore, they need encouragement to not go back. They also need to know that their new family, the church, is there for them. And we need to let them know that. And so these new churches, which had new believers, needed encouragement. And Paul and his ministry team were there to encourage them to do what? Well, to keep up the good fight of faith. And so it is for us, isn't it? that we need to keep up the good fight of faith. Now, we see in verse 3 that uh, the Lord uh, protected Paul because it says uh, there he spent three months and when, and when a plot was made uh, against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. Now, the Jews there would be Jewish leaders. And this isn't the first time we've seen Jewish leaders wanting to get rid of Paul. They were tired, these Jewish leaders were tired of how the Lord was using the Apostle Paul and others. They were tired of how all these new churches were popping up. And they were tired of how Christianity just kept growing and growing and growing. In spite of the fact that there was persecution going on of the churches, they still continued to grow. And so their thought probably was, if we can get, one, get rid of one of their top leaders, the Apostle Paul, well, then maybe this whole Christianity thing would die as well. But as we saw, the Lord protected Paul, and he returned through Macedonia. Then we see in verse 5 uh, of chapter 20, uh, Paul's ministry team and, uh, had gone on ahead of him to Troas, uh, and we see, that, uh, we, we see the word we being used again. No, remember, there was a transition that took place several chapters ago where it was they, or from we to they, and now we've gone from they to we. So that tells us that Luke, who wrote the, the book of Acts, has now joined back up with Paul. All right, so he is back with them. 
because it says we came to them at Troas. So that brings us back to uh, verse 7, 7 through 12, where we read verses 7 through 9, where uh, they have met together, um, and we're going to look at what all is going on in those verses. But, but the last thing that we read about was verse 9, where this guy named Eutychus falls out of a th- third-story window to his death. So let's kind of work our way back up to verse 9 to see what happens in verse 10. So we see in verse 7 uh, that they were meeting on the first day of the week. Now this would be Sunday, not Saturday. Okay, So it's moved. Now those in attendance had probably, believe it or not, had probably worked that day because you have to remember this was a time of transition in the book of Acts. Um, And we have to keep that in mind. So they're moving from Sabbath, Saturday to Sunday. Second, we see a couple of things concerning the gathering that we read in verses 7 through 9. First, we see that they took communion. Now think about it. This is a young church. Um, Not very old. It has new members, new believers in this church. I say new church, relatively new and here they have some of the apostles in their service. How would we feel if we're the first century church and we've gathered together? And now we're, we would not have gathered here like this. We, as we'll see in a moment, we would have gathered in a house, somebody's house. And so, so we've gathered together in this house, and, and lo and behold, we find out the apostle Paul will be with us tonight. And not only will the apostle Paul, but Dr. Luke himself will be with us in service How would we feel? And they're going to lead us in communion. I think we would be a little excited, wouldn't we? Would we not? Well, I would. I don't know about the rest of you. To have the Apostle Paul, the one that you hear all these stories about, the fact of all that God's been doing through this man named the Apostle Paul, the one who had been killing Christians and putting them in jail and, and persecuting them, and now all of a sudden he's come to faith in Jesus, and we're fast-forwarding a few years later, now he's done all these journeys, and he's doing, and, and all these churches are being started through this one guy named the Apostle Paul, and he's going to be with us in service. I think they would be excited. The second thing is the Apostle Paul was sharing what the Lord was doing. Verse 7 says, Paul talked with them intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. There's a lot I want to say here. You think I'm long-winded. Paul went till midnight, people. Midnight. And as we'll see a little bit later, he actually goes till sunrise all night long. So just relax. We're going to be here a while. So Paul was discussing with the people all that the Lord was doing. Now, can you imagine the stories, the accounts that Paul was relaying to those people to encourage them in the faith? Can you imagine as he talks about the Ephesus, what he had just gone through in Ephesus. Remember? In Acts 19. The, the, the danger that they were just in and how the Lord watched over them. Not only did, 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 did he go till midnight in his speech, not only was he just telling them about all the Lord was doing, but you know he opened up the scriptures to them. I'm sure those that were in the house were super excited that the Apostle Paul was opening the scriptures to teach them, to encourage them in the faith. And again, so what we see is he he got, Paul got so worked up, he was so excited himself. Remember, Paul's human just like we are. And so Paul got excited about all that was going on, all that the Lord was doing, and how he was encouraging those in the faith. He went until midnight. But then we read in verses 8 and 9, that's when tragedy struck. Again, it says there were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered, or where we were gathered, and a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. So they are at the house of Carpus. 
Now, how do we know that he's at the house of Carpus? Well, as one commentator noted, in Paul's final letter from jail in Rome, from Rome, in 2 Timothy 4.13, he asked Timothy to start, to stop rather, at Carpus's house in Troas and pick up his robe that he had left there. And so theologians tell us when you add two and two together that the, the house they met in in Acts chapter 20 was this guy by the name of Carpus. And this Carpus fellow had a three-story house. So he was a wealthy man. So here's the setting. They're at a three-story house, top floor. It's crowded. It is night, and the lamps, the lamps here would be torches. So they were flickering in the room. Right now, what would have been cool if I had someone start flickering the lights. That would be good. So due to the people, think about it, it's, it's, it, there's more people there than probably normal, right? Because if, look around the room right now, if we said, oh, by the way, the Apostle Paul's going to be here tonight, do you think we'd be full? We'd be full. We, we'd be at standing room only. So more than likely, they're, they're in this top story. It's, it's more crowded because Paul and the others are there. One, one writer noted, quote, the Mediterranean heat the grimy press of the weary crowd just returned from work, the smoke from the torches, the lack of oxygen all made for drowsiness. Finally, they said, nature asserted itself. And so a young man by the name of Eutychus falls asleep, a deep sleep. I mean, he was out. And he falls from a three-story window to his death. Can you imagine the scene? Can you hear the screams? Can you imagine what that felt like in that moment when they realized that this guy has fallen out of the window to his death? Now notice verse 10. But Paul went down and bent over him and taking him in his arms said, Do not be alarmed for his life is in him. And God raises him from the dead. Now think about the mood. We have gone, in a matter of moments, we have gone from tears, screaming, fear, to all of a sudden the guy who was dead is now alive. I would think it would, be, uh, it would go from a time of mourning to a time of awe thankfulness, and celebration, right? We would all, if we watched a man die, and then we saw that God used this guy by the name of Paul to raise this guy from the dead, we would be in awe of God. We would be thankful, and we would celebrate his life, but I think more than anything, we would stand in awe of what God had just done. Do you think everybody's awake now? Remember, it's midnight or a little after midnight. Maybe it's 12, 30, 1 o'clock. And we see in verses 11 and 12, And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak. And so he departed. And they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. Now that, that last phrase in verse 12, let me read it from another translation. It says, meanwhile, the young man was taken home unhurt, and everyone was greatly relieved. Now, 13 through 16, because I want to get to our application. Let me just finish up with 13 through 16 and then, and then talk about a couple things. 13 through 16, we see Paul's desire to be back in Jerusalem. Notice what it says. But verse 13, but going ahead to the ship, remember he finishes his talk, he goes all night long, he speaks to the crowd all night long. And then at, at daybreak it's time for them to leave. So, but going ahead to the ship we set sail for Asos, intending to take Paul aboard there, for so he had arranged, intending himself to go by land. And when he had met us at Asos, we took him on board and went to Middleland. And sailing from there, we came the following day opposite 
Chios. The next day we touched at Samos, and the day after that we went to Miletus. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. And so that's just, all we need to see there is Paul's, Paul's desire to be back in Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost, to celebrate all that took place on the day of Pentecost. So what's some application for us? Is this account in Acts 20 only about some guy falling asleep and falling out of a third-story window and coming back to life? No. It's not. There are some spiritual applications that we can make. One is, um, as we think about this, there are three types of people at any given time sitting in a church service. Maybe right now. So we have the spiritually asleep or the spiritually dead. These are people that are unsaved. The Bible tells us that those who are not saved are spiritually dead. Doesn't matter how much they come to church. Doesn't matter what they participate in. If they if they're not saved, they're not saved. The second person is the backslider. One writer uh, said this about a person who's backslidden. Quote: Sin makes us indifferent and bored with spiritual things. That's true, isn't it? The more we have sin in our lives, the less desire we will want the things of God. Because our hearts aren't right. Our hearts are far from God. And if our hearts are far from God, we're not going to want the things of God. That's the backslidden. And then there's what I like to call the, the, long, the lifelong church goer. This is the one who was raised in church maybe all their lives. Someone once wrote, they knew concerning these people who are lifelong churchgoers. That's not a bad thing necessarily, that's not, so don't get, don't get what I'm saying. But uh, quote says, uh, they knew the doxology before their multiplication tables, right? It is possible that a person can simply get bored because everything becomes so familiar, right? We're going to sing this song, and we're going to do it this way, and we're going to take the offering up this way, and at this time, and it just becomes familiar, and it becomes too familiar that we get bored. So what's the answer? Well, let me give us three things. One is if you're not saved, then a person needs what? Salvation, right? If a person is backslidden, they need repentance. That's the only answer for a person that's backslidden. It's not to do better. It's not to think better. It's to repent. Then you'll start being better and acting better and thinking better and talking better. But it starts with repentance. And for the lifelong churchgoer, what do you do? What do you do when everything becomes too familiar? Well, let's, let's think about a church service, for example. What do you do when you're in a church service and you're like, well, we're gonna, I know, first we're gonna, Michael's going to get up, open in prayer, Anna's going to give some announcements, and we're going to sing our first song. So what do you do? Well, instead of just singing the song to sing the song, why don't you sing that song to Jesus? Why don't you focus in on the words you're singing about and not just sing the song to sing the song, but to actually think about what you're singing? When someone stands up and prays, instead of just standing there or sitting there while someone prays, pray. You pray. If I'm up here praying... The best thing you can do to get involved in the service is not listen to me pray. But you start praying. God can handle more than one person praying. Isn't that awesome? 
He can hear all these voices at one time and hear every single word that we're praying. By the way, he does it all the time. Because somewhere around the world, there's a multiplicity of people that are, sing that are praying, and he hears them all. And I would say this when it comes to the scriptures. And it is this, that when you hear the scriptures being read or you hear the scriptures being preached, remember that those words you hear come from the Bible. They are God's very words. This book, this is not just some things about God, though it tells us things about God. These aren't just, these aren't just uh, um, some words that some humans constructed but rather the Bible is God's very words that he desired to give us as human beings. His words. So when you hear the Bible being read, when, you, when, when, when people open this up and they begin to read from this, remind yourself that this is God's very word. And that when you're listening to someone read the Bible, you are listening to God's words to you, to all of us. It is so easy. I know it's easy. It is easy as a pastor to just pump out sermons and just pump out sermons because guess what? Every Sunday rolls around. And every Sunday night rolls around. And every Wednesday rolls around. And when you finish with Wednesday, you know what's coming. Sunday. And when Sunday's over, you know what's coming? Wednesday. It's coming. It doesn't stop. And it's so easy at times to just pump stuff out because you have to get it done. And so I'm talking to all of us tonight that when those moments when we just get, it just becomes so familiar and it just becomes routine. It, just take a moment and think about what you're doing. Think about what you're getting to participate in. And if we'll do that, it'll change everything. If we've become stale, it will refresh us. So my encouragement to us is think about what we do every time we get together. And it really will change everything. I encourage you, uh, as we get ready to dismiss in prayer, uh, be remembering one another. We have so much sickness going on right now. We have so many that are battling so many different things. And uh, not just sickness, but just stuff going on in life. And so I just want to encourage us to remember each other, pray for one another. Send an email or a card or a text or what else is there? Facebook message, a tweet, uh, well, I don't know, whatever else there is. Um, but if you think about somebody that you haven't seen in a Sunday or two won't you send them a note and let them know they've been missed so I encourage you to do that let's pray Father we thank you for your precious word and Lord I'm sorry for the times that we just go through the motions of worship. Forgive us, Lord. I ask, Lord, that you would help us that every time we gather together that we remember that we are singing to you, that when we give our offering, we are giving to you, that when we hear your word, we are indeed hearing that. We are hearing from you. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would Help us to be mindful of those things when we gather together week in and week out. And so, Father, we also pray tonight for those who are sick. Lord, for many who are, uh, have so many different physical ailments that they're going through. And um, we just lift them up to you tonight. And we pray that you administer to their bodies. Lord, we pray for, for those who um, need encouragement, that you would encourage their hearts. Lord, we pray for those, if there's someone in our church, Lord, who is backslidden, who's a follower of you, but, Lord, they, their hearts are just not where they need to be. Lord, we pray tonight that they would repent and they would come home to you so that they may experience the joy of the Lord. 
Father, we pray for others that come to church here that may not know you as Savior and Lord, how we ask, Lord, that you would continue to deal with their hearts and help them see their need for Jesus. Father, thank you for what you're doing in this place, and thank you for what you're doing in the lives of your people. Lord, we love you tonight, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You're dismissed.